Uh, one of the phenomena that we have been studying at the Division of Perceptual Studies at UVA University of Virginia for the past 50 years is near-death experiences, or NDEs. The concept of near-death experiences has become quite well known in, in our culture. There's a core that is similar in all NDEs, but each one is different. Each individual is different. To make it even harder to study near-death experiences, when you ask an experiencer what happened to them, they often start by saying, well, it's, it can't be put into words. There are no words for this. And we researchers say, great, tell me all about it. <laughs> so we know that by making them put into words, we're distorting the situation. And we're not studying the experience. We're studying what they tell us about the experience, which is not the same thing. So let me start by giving you a general guideline of how we manage to understand these NDEs. In studying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, we've come up with four different groups of features in near-death experiences. I should also say first that what an experience, what near-death experience is not, a near-death experience is not just a close brush with death. Many people, when they come close to death, report profound experiences in which they seem to leave their physical bodies and move beyond the boundaries of time and space. NDEs have been reported by many diverse ancient cultures. They appear in the writings of Plato, in the Bible, in the writings of Tibet, India, Egypt, China, Japan, in the folklore of the South Pacific and of Native Americans. The interpretation of the experience may vary from one culture to another, but the basic experience is the same over the centuries and around the globe. These transcendental or mystical experiences that occur near death were written about in the medical literature from the 19th century on. They were described as a discrete syndrome in 1892 by Albert Heim, a Swiss ge geologist who had one when he fell in the Alps. And in the 1890s, there was a flurry of literature about them in French philosophy journals in which the term near-death experience was first coined. The term near-death experience in English was popularized by Raymond Moody who wrote a book in 1975 called Life After Life, which you may have read. And before that book, virtually no one in the Western Hemisphere had heard of a near-death experience. But Moody described about 50 such cases and outlined what he thought were the common features. And that was essentially the model we have. There's been a lot of controversy since then about the interpretation of NDEs, which is partly due to the confusion over the criteria for death. And in fact, it's often very hard to tell when someone is close to death or how close to death they are. However, studies at the University of Virginia, in the United Kingdom, and in Holland have shown that among people who have had documented close brushes with death, for example, with a cardiac arrest, between 10 and 20 percent will report near-death experiences. That doesn't mean 10 to 20 percent have them. That means 10 to 20% have them and can remember them and can put them into words and choose to do so. So we have categorized the phenomena of near-death experiences into four components. Changes in thinking and thought processes, changes in emotions or feeling, the so-called paranormal features, and the otherworldly features. The first group, the changes in thinking process, include your sense of time being grossly distorted or missing entirely, your thoughts going faster than ever before and often clearer than ever before, a sense of life review or panoramic memory where your whole life may come back to you in a flash, and a sense of sudden understanding or revelation. Let me give you a brief example. A 44-year-old man standing on a ladder leaning against his house suddenly fell backward. He described this changes in his thinking as follows. Ensnared in a backward sliding ladder, the actual fall slowed way down, 
almost like a series of camera still pictures being taken, a click, click sort of visual progression. During the next few sec sec seconds or fractions thereof, I was unaware of any bodily sensations, but rather saw my life flash before me in a series of typical scenes. And this slowing up dramatically increased my thinking speed so that I was able to size up how I could maneuver the ladder and not end up on the flagstones from two stories up. Not only did the fall slow way down, but my thinking became very, very clear in split seconds. I remember wanting to head for the shrubs, which though they might pierce my skin, would break my fall. So those are the changes in thinking that are typical of a near-death experience. There are also changes in feeling or emotion, which include an overwhelming sense of peace or well-being, feelings of joy, a sense of cosmic unity or oneness with everything, and an encounter with the bright light which often is characterized by this unconditional love. A 74-year-old woman described the emotional changes in her NDE during a heart attack in this way. She said, I seemed to be floating in a more or less confined space, but there were no walls as we know them. I was moving in and out of a billowing soft, dark, purple velvety substance. It was beautiful, sensual, voluptuous, sort of like falling into a great mass of soft satin and down feathers. I was completely surrounded by this substance and I floated up and down restfully. Each time I got near the bottom, I could see a great brightness at the end of this space. The brightness was warm, soft, and so welcoming. I didn't seem to have a body or a mind. I didn't seem to be a person or even a thing. I was peaceful, happy, contented. I didn't seem to care about anything anymore. It was not a feeling you can put into words. No mind, no body, no boundaries, only contentment. Sort of like an amoeba that had gotten into the ocean by mistake. So those are the typical changes in feeling. In addition, there are what seem to be paranormal features during the NDE. Your normal physical senses of vision, hearing, smell, touch are much more vivid and much more acute than they ever were before. You may see colors that you've never seen on Earth, hear sounds that you've never heard. They have frank extrasensory perception, visions of the future, and a sense of leaving the physical body. A 26-year-old woman who had a pulmonary embolism described her paranormal features as follows. I drifted out of the body and hovered near the ceiling. I viewed the activity in the room from this vantage point. It confused me that the doctors and nurses in the room were so concerned about the body they had lifted on the bed. I tried to tell them I was not in the body. Obviously, they didn't hear me. One of the most outstanding things about this experience is that my hearing became extremely acute. I heard many things about the gravity of my situation, some of them coming from the nurse's station many yards away. I watched the hospital personnel at work. I listened to their comments, and I began to feel sorry for them because they were working so hard when I felt so happy and I was feeling no pain where I was. So those are the paranormal features. In addition, there are what seem to be otherworldly features of the NDE finding yourself in some type of mystical or unearthly realm of existence, encountering some mystical being or presence, seeing deceased spirits or religious spirits, and finally coming to a border or point of no return beyond which you can't return to life. A 26-year-old woman who had an emergency cesarean section reported her otherworldly features in this way. She said, I heard my doctor say, I've lost her, she's gone. Then an angel was carrying me through a huge, great auditorium. The two large doors of the auditorium opened, and we went out and up through space. I saw a beautiful white city with a wall around it and a set of gates facing me. As we got closer, I heard excited voices. They were questioning why the angel was bringing me now. She was unperturbed by the excitement and continued to approach the gates. 
I heard one of them say, she knows it is not her time. Why is she bringing her here now? And another one said to the angel, it's not her time. She can't come in. All of a sudden, I found myself back on the operating table. My doctor said, I'm so glad you're back. <laughs> I was crying as if my heart would break, telling him I didn't want to come back. I begged him to let me go again. It was so beautiful. It was the saddest time of my life, and yet it was the most beautiful. I've described these four, four snippets of NDEs to illustrate the changes in thinking, changes in feeling, the paranormal, and the otherworldly features. One of the problems we have in studying near-death experiences is that all our research is retrospective. That is, we start with someone now, today, who's telling us about an experience they had in the past. So we have to reconstruct what happened. Now, NDEs will typically say, it's like it happened yesterday. The vividness has not gone away at all. But we know that our memories are faulty, and we distort things over time. So how do we know that the memories of NDEs are accurate? Some skeptics claim that these are all embellishments, that the longer time passes after the NDE, the more elaborate it gets, and particularly the more blissful it gets with retelling over time. Because we've been studying these NDEs for five decades now, we're able to address this question. Starting in 2002, I began tracking down people whom I had interviewed about their NDEs in the early 1980s and asking them to again describe to me their NDEs just as they had 20 years earlier. And we found something very interesting. These are scores. The green scores are what people told me in the 1980s and the red bars are what they told me in the 2000s. And the first column there, there's there, the first column, is the total depth of the NDE on a scale that we use. And as you can see, it's virtually the same 20 years later. Certainly not embellished, it may be slightly less, but statistically the same. The next bars are for changes in thinking, changes in feeling, paranormal phenomena, and the transcendental aspects. And in each case, the, f the reports are the same after 20 years. So what this means is that NDE memories are reliable over time, and therefore retrospective research is reliable. Another important question about these retrospective research studies is that all our experiences are influenced by our cultural beliefs. And how do we know whether these NDE reports are just determined by what you expect is going to happen to you? We know that most of our experiences are influenced by culture. For example, many people in the West will talk about going through a tunnel. People in third world countries where there aren't a lot of tunnels don't talk about that. But they will say it went into a cave or into a well one near-death experience I interviewed who was a truck driver talked about being sucked into a tailpipe. <laughs> so the phenomenon is the same of going through a long, dark, enclosed space to get to this other realm. But you describe it with whatever cultural metaphor is available to you. So our NDE is just reporting what they expect to have happen. The dominant model in the West for the past 40 years has been Raymond Moody's. But at UVA, University of Virginia, we've been collecting these reports from the early 1960s, many years before Moody wrote his book, telling us what we're supposed to have happen in the NDE. We compared 24 of the best cases we had from before 1975 when Moody wrote his book with 24 cases from the last decade matched in terms of age, race, gender, religion, religiosity, how they came close to death, and how close to death they came. And what we found was, again, essentially no difference. The green bars are the reports we collected before Moody wrote his book, and the red bars are accounts we collected in the last decade. And you can see with out-of-body experiences, feelings of peace, 
meeting other entities, being of light, hearing music or noise, life review, all statistically the same before Moody wrote his book telling us what we're supposed to experience and after. Moody also wrote about the after effects, so we asked about those as well. And again, the green bar is before Moody wrote his book, and the red bar is after. Every experiencer in both samples, 100% of them reported dramatic attitude changes. They also reported, all the bars aren't labeled there, but they also reported less fear of death, having difficulty telling other people, increased belief in survival, and people corroborating what they experienced out of body. If they said, I saw this happen, people said, yes, that really happened. With equal frequency after Moody wrote his book and before Moody wrote his book. So the NDE reports are not influenced by the widespread public knowledge of Moody's model. Although the interpretation of NDEs may be influenced by your culture, what metaphors you use to describe it, the basic experience is not determined by your culture. So how do we explain these experiences? No variables that we've studied yet are able to predict whether you're going to have an NDE or what kind you're going to have. We've looked at age, gender, race, religion, religion, religiosity, history of mental illness, and none of those things are associated with NDEs or a specific type of NDE. There's been a lot of speculation about physiological causes that may be related to the NDE, lack of oxygen, endorphins, temporal lobe seizures. The bottom line with all these explanations, though, is that you can't reconcile the enhanced mental functioning, the heightened perceptions, the, height, the faster thinking, the clearer thinking, the deep detailed memories with the fact that the brain is not functioning. So why should we care about these NDEs? One reason is that they usually lead to a consistent pattern of changes in attitudes, beliefs, and values. And we've studied these and confirmed them with long-term studies of NDEers over decades, and also by interviews with their significant others. So it's not just the NDEer telling us that, it's their husbands and their wives and their children telling us as well. And we find that there are a lot of attitudes that are consistently increased after a near-death experiences. We see dramatic increases in spirituality, in compassion and concern for other people, in appreciation for life, in a sense of meaning or purpose in life, in confidence and flexibility in your being able to cope with stressors, in belief in survival after death. Now, some of these things will happen to anybody who comes close to death. For example, an appreciation of life is usually enhanced no matter who they are if they've come close to death. But others, such as the constant confidence in being able to cope and belief in postmortem survival, are unique to NDEers. People who come close to death but don't have NDEs don't have these things. In addition to these attitudes that are increased, there are attitudes that are decreased consistently after an NDE. NDEers consistently report decreased or totally absent fear of death. They report decreased interest in material possessions, in physical things, decreased interest in personal status, power, prestige, fame, and decreased interest in competition, more interest in collaboration and altruistic activities than in competitive activities. Sometimes these changes are so marked that the experiencers seem to be different people than they were before the NDE. A second reason that we should be interested in NDEs is for what they tell us about the possibility of survival after death. I mentioned the Division of Perceptual Studies was founded in part to explore the possibility that something about us survives bodily death. And near-death experiences do provide some evidence bearing on that. Is death the end of existence? Or is death just a change of state? So what about the near-death experience bears on the question of whether we survive death? First, there was the enhanced mental functioning, thinking faster and clearer than ever before when your brain is not functioning. 
And one example of this is Pam Reynolds, who had a huge aneurysm at the base of her brain that couldn't be operated on because to get to that would destroy the, would, would burst it, and she would bleed to death. So they did an experimental procedure with her, experimental then, now it's, it's, it's more commonly used, where they cooled her body down to 60 degrees and drained all the blood out of her body so you can go in and cut the aneurysm without risking her bleeding to death. So she was without any blood going to her brain, no blood in her body at all, for about an hour. It took longer than they thought to do this procedure for various reasons, so they had to cool her body and replace the blood faster than, than they wanted to. And as a result, her heart stopped twice as they were trying to uh, bring her back. Her brain was being monitored for the whole procedure, and there was no electrical activity in her brain. So we know she was having no brain function. And yet she reported a very detailed near-death experience, reporting accurately things going on in the surgery room, some things that she found interesting, some things she found offensive in the room. And she reported meeting deceased loved ones who told her she had to go back. So this is something that you can't explain in a materialistic model that the mind is what the brain does. You have no brain function and you have enhanced mind function. Secondly, you have accurate perceptions from an out-of-body perspective. If you're in your body, how can you see things accurately from outside? One of my favorite examples is Al Sullivan from Hartford, Connecticut, who's a truck driver who had quadruple bypass surgery. And in the surgery, he left his body and looked down, and as he described it, his surgeon was flapping his arms as if he was trying to fly. That's not something you'd think of a surgeon doing during surgery. Not something they show you in television shows about surgery. So Al asked the surgeon when he recovered about that, and the surgeon got very angry and said, who told you about that? Al said, well, I, I was watching you. <laughs> the surgeon got very defensive and said, well, I must, I must have done something right because you're here, aren't you? I then, I interviewed the surgeon myself. Because I, in my medical career, I'd never seen a surgeon do anything like that. <laughs> and he explained that he would let his interns start the procedure and then he would scrub in, get his hands sterile, put on the sterile gloves, and then go in to supervise them. And he didn't want to risk touching anything that was not in the sterile field with his sterile gloves. So he put them where he knew they wouldn't get into trouble. And then he would supervise. You know, pull over there more, a little more. Cut over here a little more. <laughs> so we have lots of examples of these accurate out-of-body perceptions. In fact, Jan Holden at the University of North Texas looked up I think she found 107 cases, published cases, of out-of-body perceptions that were potentially corroboratable. And more than 90% were entirely accurate, no mistakes at all, including 90% of those that were corroborated by someone else other than the experiencer. So we definitely have accurate perceptions when you're not in the body. Third, we have information that was given to people during a near-death experience from deceased loved ones that they see. Often when near-death experiences say, I saw my grandmother, the skeptics say, that's just wishful thinking, of course you would. But sometimes they tell us information we couldn't have gotten in any other way. For example, there are several cases of the deceased people telling the near-death experiencer where something was hidden, an important document, an important treasure. There's a great case from Pliny the Elder in something like 30 BC, uh, describing a case like this, where someone told his brother who was having a near-death experience where the money was hidden. In some cases, the deceased person that the near-death experiencer sees is someone who was not known to be dead. And these are cases that cannot be uh, dismissed easily as wishful thinking. In one typical case from our files, an elderly woman was surrounded on her deathbed by her grandchildren. And she seemed to be slipping away, but then she suddenly opened her eyes and became very alert and said excitedly, oh, Will, are you here? And then she died. There was no one named Will in the room. And the family was trying to figure out who was she talking about. 
the only will they could think of was their great uncle, her brother, who lived in England. Not long after her death, they received word that he had died two days earlier. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross told a story about a young girl who was an only child who almost died during heart surgery. And she said that in her near-death experiences, she met someone who identified himself as her brother. When she told her father about this, he was so moved that he confessed to her that she had, in fact, had a son who died before she was born, and she was never told about him. We've identified dozens of cases of these type, again, dating back to ancient Greece, that just can't be explained in terms of a materialistic model. The bottom line is that near-death experiences suggest that mind and brain are not the same thing, that mind seems to function quite well when the brain is not, in fact, maybe better when the brain is not functioning, <laughs> and that we need to question some of our basic assumptions about not only mind and brain, but the universe and our role in it. Well, it's about time for our break now, so we will stick around for questions after the break, but uh, <laughs> thank you.